Picking which MacBook Air to buy isn't exactly easy. I mean, even the created cat struggles and testing MacBooks is her full-time job. At least it's supposed to be. So there's the M1, M2, and of course the M3 MacBook Air. Should you get the latest and greatest or maybe an older version to save some money, but if you do, how does it compare to the others? So I made this video to make the decision easier and potentially save you hundreds of dollars. And I've put all of these MacBooks to the test, including the all important lap test. First, let's start with physical differences. There's two main options here, the original M1 MacBook Air design or the new redesigned M2 and M3 chassis. Now, although all three MacBooks are almost identical in terms of footprint, uh, size and weight, there are some pretty major differences between the original design on the M1 and the new design on the M2 and the M3. To put it simply, the new design is better in almost every single way. Now I made a really detailed video comparing the original uh, to the new design and I'll link that in the description. But to briefly summarize, the screen gets brighter on the redesign, which is good if you use the MacBook in bright environments like outside. The webcam is 1080p on the new design versus 720p on the original and the new design gets a heap of additional features like improved audio via a four speaker sound system with support for spatial audio, a wider trackpad, more tactile keys, and an additional MagSafe port for charging. Now that last one doesn't really sound that groundbreaking, but it kind of is when you realize all three of these MacBooks only have two Thunderbolt slash USB 4 ports. So if you're using the M1 MacBook Air and you're charging it using one of these ports, uh, you know, you've only got one left. Now, if you're wondering what the physical differences are between the M2 and the M3 MacBook Air, the good news is that it's really simple. Uh, there's none. Uh, except for a fancy new anodization seal to supposedly help to reduce fingerprints, uh, but only on the darker midnight color option, which I actually don't recommend because even with the anodization seal, it just smudges and shows grease and fingerprints way too easily. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, color is personal preference. Personally, I love the classic silver color or a close second is the space gray. Uh, I found they just don't really show marks and wear and tear that much and it just ages better than the darker colors. Also the M3 can output to two external monitors at the same time versus the M2 which can only output to one. There is a caveat to this though, on the M3 uh, you actually have to close the screen lid in order to output to that second monitor. Side note, the M3 also comes with Wi-Fi 6E. So if you have network equipment that can actually take advantage of Wi-Fi 6E, uh, that's just a nice little bonus. So let's talk about how the M1, M2 and M3 differ from each other. Now, in this video, I'm comparing the base model chips with no upgrades. Here's a comparison chart showing you some of the differences. The configuration of the base models in this video and in brackets, if any upgrades are available, the maximum possible configuration you can select. So everything looks pretty similar, right? I mean, same number of CPU cores, same base model RAM and SSD sizes. The only difference is that the M2 and M3 come with an extra GPU core with the option to pay $100 more to upgrade to a 10 core GPU. Now, should you pay extra to get the additional two GPU cores? Uh, no, there's almost no added benefit. However, if you upgrade the RAM or the SSD on either the uh, M2 or the M3, the 10 core GPU upgrade is automatically included for free and also comes with a slightly more powerful charger with an extra USB-C port. So that's something to keep in mind. Now the M3 chip is also the first Apple Silicon chip to use the new three nanometer technology. Now, sparing you all of the technical jargon, it just means more transistors can be crammed into the chip allowing it to theoretically perform more tasks simultaneously and at a faster rate while using less power and generating less heat. And that's a good thing for a laptop. The M2 and M3 have some additional ProRes video encode and decode engines that the M1 does not. And the M3 has some exclusive new tech like AV1 decoding and ray tracing, but more on that later. 
Now, SSD speed is comparable between all three, with the exception of the M2, which has significantly slower read speeds, AKA the speed that files and data on the SSD can be accessed by you or the operating system. Now, you probably won't notice this in everyday usage, but if you want to know more and why the SSD is slower on the M2, I made a separate video on that topic that I'll link in the description. Okay, let's talk about everyday performance. You know, the things you do most of the time while using your laptop, like emails, web browsing, Word documents, etc. There's no real noticeable difference between all three. And I usually have quite a few apps open at the same time, uh, two email clients, Slack, Notion, Excel, Spotify, and on top of that, usually 10 to 15 browser tabs. And sometimes there'll be some other apps sprinkled in there. And look, my experience was really smooth and it was actually very difficult to throw enough at any of these three systems to get them to display any signs of stress. As a little test, I reformatted an M1 and M2 MacBook Air, installed the latest version of Mac OS and tested all three side by side. These are all the base models, by the way, with eight gigabytes of RAM. Apps or web pages open or load at almost exactly the same time. Uh, sure, there are some tiny differences, like sometimes the M2 might open an app a split second faster than the M3, for example, but in real life, there's effectively no difference. Now, just before I talk about battery life, now's also a good time to mention another device that will add portability and additional battery life to your day. And that is the AnchorWork S600. The AnchorWork S600 is the ultimate accessory for your phone at home, easily transforming it into a conference hub with tons of incredible features. Unlike other speaker phones, the S600 looks nice and goes with any kind of home decor and furniture. It's also completely wireless. I mean, I can take it and have conference calls or listen to music anywhere with its five watt speaker output and 360 degrees of sound and dual passive radiator design for enhanced bass. You can charge your phone with 15 watts of magnetic wireless charging, and the magnets also allow you to quickly attach and detach your phone and position it however you want. You'll also enjoy noise-free calls and eliminate background distractions via the Voice Radar 3.5 AI noise reduction feature. I also set up voice print recognition via the AnchorWork app, which uses biometric technology to actively block unexpected voices during calls, allowing you to have private meetings at home without worrying about your family making noise. Nothing worse than your boss overhearing your significant other saying something embarrassing. So make sure you click the link in the description below and grab your AnchorWork S600 today. Okay, let's talk about battery life on these MacBook Airs. Well, Apple claims the same 15 hours of wireless web browsing on all three. And you know what? This is fairly accurate. I mean, I consistently get roughly 12 to 14 hours on a charge as long as I'm not doing anything super intensive. And it makes sense, right? Because all three have a very similar sized battery. 49.9 watt hours on the M1 and the same 52.6 watt hour battery on both the M2 and M3. But a big focus for Apple with the M3 chip was efficiency. It's supposed to use less battery life than its predecessors to accomplish the same tasks. Now, if you watch a lot of YouTube videos, for example, YouTube has started using a video codec called AV1, which is essentially just a new and more efficient method of getting the video from YouTube server onto your screen. And now the M3 chip comes with an AV1 decode engine, allowing the M3 to stream and play back these videos super easily and with almost no CPU or GPU processing power required, which obviously saves battery. Now, AV1 is still in the early stages. Not all videos online, including YouTube, take advantage of it, but let's see how that and also the M3 being the new and more efficient three nanometer design impacts battery life. So I charged all three to 100% battery, did the exact same real life tasks on each MacBook, including some more intensive stuff, but mostly streaming YouTube videos. And I stopped when the M1 reached 5% battery life. In comparison, the M2 was at 16% and the M3 was at 19%. Now that's a fairly significant difference, right? However, you also need to remember that unless the M1 or M2 MacBook 
is brand new and of course its battery is in perfect health, uh, its battery life is already going to be degraded somewhat. If you take my M1 MacBook Air as an example, it's now almost four years old and is sitting at about 90% maximum battery capacity, which is actually pretty good for four years. So if you buy an M1 or M2 brand new, uh, battery life is going to be very similar to the M3, even with you know, all the new efficiency in the M3 chip. Now, in terms of thermals, AKA how hot these MacBooks get, uh, during normal everyday use, they get warm, but just barely. Uh, you're not gonna notice any significant heat from the metal chassis. I, mean, I have no issues using any of them on my lap with bare skin or resting my hands on the keyboard when typing, for example. Only when pushing the MacBooks to unrealistic extremes do you see any serious heat output. The chips reach around 95 to 100 degrees Celsius, and the back chassis that may sit on your lap can get up to 44 degrees Celsius, which is very uncomfortable on bare skin. Uh, side note, the M2 is the hottest of the bunch. The M1 and also the M3 seem to perform around the same, a few degrees cooler if you're looking at the back of them. Again, these temperatures are only when doing extremely intensive stuff that push the system to its absolute limit. Remember, this is the air lineup of MacBooks, so they you know, don't have fans and they're instead passively cooled by a small metal heatsink attached to the chip. If you start to push it hard, it's gonna get hot. Now this leads perfectly into the next segment. So let's look at some more demanding tasks that you may throw at these MacBooks because under the hood, they actually have a surprising amount of performance. I mean, you can easily edit the occasional 4K video or photos in Lightroom or even do some light gaming and 3D animation. But, and I really want to stress this, a MacBook Air is not the laptop you should be buying if you want to be regularly doing intensive stuff. The Air, like you know, the name suggests, right, is meant to be a portable lightweight laptop best suited to everyday tasks like web browsing, note taking at school, or you know, emails, for example. And if you try to push it too hard, uh, you will reach its limit very easily. If you are looking for more power and performance, definitely consider the next tier up the 14-inch M1 Pro, M2 Pro, or M3 Pro MacBooks. This is a video I made comparing them. I used most of the same testing protocols as the video you're watching now, so just watch that one to see if you should maybe get the more powerful one. Okay, with that being said, let's see how the performance on the MacBook Airs stack up against each other. As you can see, there's no real CPU performance differences between the three. Uh, the M3 is superior, but only just, especially in real life situations like a developer compiling code, for example. These minimal differences also apply to creative apps like Photoshop, After Effects, or video editing programs like Final Cut, Resolve, and Premiere. Note that really the only advantage the M2 and M3 have over the M1 is the additional ProRes hardware encoders and decoders. This means the MacBook can easily play back in timeline scrub footage recorded in the ProRes video codec when you're editing it. But unless you're specifically recording your footage in ProRes, like on your iPhone, for example, or rendering your video in ProRes, uh, there's no major difference between all three. Now, if you like to dabble in 3D applications like Cinema 4D or Blender, the M3 with its new hardware accelerated ray tracing technology is the clear winner. But just make sure whatever program you're using or intend to use has been updated to take advantage of ray tracing. Otherwise, the performance is about the same as the M2. If you play the occasional game, the M2 and the M3 see a performance boost over the M1. But just remember, if the game is too demanding, you're just not gonna have a good time. Older or less graphically intensive games run pretty well, and you can often play Mac optimized games like Resident Evil Village, but again, with relatively limited performance. I mean, these MacBooks just aren't designed with gaming in mind. So which one should you buy? Look, it really comes down to price, right? As per usual. Right now, you can get all of these MacBook Airs brand new at the following price points. Note that Apple has stopped selling the M1 on their website. You can only get it from third-party retailers like Best Buy. 
which also means Apple won't be supporting the M1 software and operating system wise as long as the M2 or the M3 which they're still selling, but more on that in this video. And look, in terms of performance, as you've seen in this video, very little difference between the three, unless you really start to push them in more intensive tasks. Personally, I really love the updated chassis of the M2 and the M3, and I think it's worth the price difference over the M1, especially if you're going to be using it every single day for you know, potentially years and years. Uh, more ports, better screen, better speakers, uh, you can't argue with that. So my advice is to A, if you've got a really limited budget, uh, you know, you can't go wrong with the M1 despite the shortcomings versus the newer generations. Alternatively, option B, if you can find an M2 brand new, but on some kind of sale or discount, definitely consider it. That would be my preferred option. Uh, they often go for 100 to 200 bucks less on third party retailers like Amazon. And I'll link the best deals I could find in the description of this video. And see if budget is less of a concern and you want maximum future proofing and longevity and just a really, really great laptop overall, just grab the M3. Um, I honestly think this is one of the best laptops you can buy right now and probably will be for the next several years. And then make sure you binge a few videos on my channel. I've covered pretty much everything you need to know about MacBooks over the last few years, including this video where I talk about possibly one of the best keyboards you can buy for a MacBook, or this one where I go over 50 of the best macOS tips and tricks that you should know.